<laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody. Episode 46 of the Faith in Whatever podcast. Actually, today, this one is just the uh, Brothers Carmen podcast. We are joined all the way from somewhere not here uh, by my brother, I guess our brother, because Chris and I are related to uh, one John Carmen. So, John, uh, who are you? We'll start with that. Who, <laughs> who are you? Who are you? I am John. I am your brother and his brother. They can't see him. <laughs> and That's a good point, though. I'm the brother of the ethereal voice. And I am a New Testament graduate student. Uh, I'm doing PhD work. So you are ABD? No, no. Hopefully I'll be ABD in like six months. Okay, so you've just passed all of your comps? No. Okay, when That's do you what find makes you ABD. When do you find out your next set of I comp take stuff? comps in like five months. Exciting? Not really? Uh, stressful, man. All right. Well, that sounds good. So what is your New Testament area of expertise? Or where have you, maybe not expertise, but where have you just spent uh, an ungodly amount of time? Ungodly. That's good. Um, I've spent a lot of time working on the problem of evil in Second Temple Judaism, more more particularly looking at the question of demons and the origin of demons and Satan and how, how do we get from the Old Testament to the New Testament because there's a sort of a quantum leap. Um, and how that's sort of d- described and depicted between the Old and the New Testament. So, that's okay, so, w- so what does that mean for those of us who are a little less intelligent? It's not about intelligence. It's just about having too much time on your hands. Um, uh, yeah, so the Old Testament doesn't really seem to talk a lot about demonic activity. There, there are some references kind of scattered throughout, but you, there's not quite the developed well, understanding. What about Genesis? With Satan in the garden. Uh, yeah, so a lot of Old Testament scholars will not view that as a like a uh, as the fully developed Satan that you have in the New Testament. They view that as just an older older tale, maybe a primordial power or something like that, but not like the the full blown Milton Satan or something like that. So not so. the red devil Mm-mm. kind of idea. Mm-mm. So, so not the shapeshifter. Yeah, so there's there's there what are about some Job one. There are some mentions of Satan. So you have Satan. The character shows up in, so Satan's not named in the garden account. It's just the serpent. But you have Satan named in Numbers. You have named in Chronicles, Job, and Zechariah. I believe those are the main places he's referenced. And the role seems to kind of be a little bit ambiguous in numbers. He's just kind of a, it's kind of an accusing angel type thing in Job. It's the same thing. Zachariah, maybe you're looking at something closer to a kind of development and the understanding of the figure of Satan, maybe more traditions are sort of building up around it. Um, a kind of a more ruminating about the character of Satan. Probably it seems like a similar thing is happening in Chronicles where you have, because Chronicles, you have the direct parallel of the king's account of David Mm -hmm. taking a census, and that leads Israel into all kinds of problems. And then in the king's account, it's an evil spirit from the Lord that does it. And then in Chronicles, it's Satan that does it. And so some people, or a lot of scholars, see that as a, I don't know if a lot, but I think a lot of scholars see that as a sort of development in the understanding of um, the problem of evil, that it's sort of getting dissociated from God being the one who's sending evil spirits and that's being now relegated to an angel or an angelic force or someone in the part of the assembly of God, similar to Job. Okay. So So you're saying that from these, what we at best call humble beginnings, right? Of of the Hebrew Bible with some type of appearance of demonology, Mm -hmm. I guess, to the new Testament where Satan is a full blown figure, Mm -hmm. uh, fully responsible for Jesus's death, Mm -hmm. I guess, in, in the book of John. Right. And so your main, and Luke. And so your main study is basically like the how and the why of that development. Yeah. Right, where it goes from not very much to just yeah. a whole bunch, you know, in, to the point where it's just like a part of everyday life in the Gospels. Yeah. So I think the, the, the question for me when I was working um, at the same school you were at, at Pepperdine, uh, I was working under a um, professor there and was really sort of just interested in the, the question of the problem of evil and what is the biblical witness about that? Is it, you know, is it the same? Because, I mean, one of the one of the questions, and this is sort of a presupposition, and it kind of depends on where you're coming from, but, you know, is there a homogenous explanation about the problem of evil, or is it something that sort of changes? Does it develop historically? I mean, we, we 
do we read the Old Testament differently in light of New Testament understandings about things and stuff like that? Like we read food laws differently. Um, Christians read food laws differently in the Old Testament because of the New Testament witness. And there, there is an evolution of some aspects of Old Testament theology in light of the New Testament. At least that's how Christians do it. And so my question was, is the problem of evil one of those kind of things? Because I hadn't thought much about that before. And so, yeah, and I, and I was working through the Gospels and realized there wasn't really anything like the full demonic possession accounts and stuff like that that you get in the Gospel of Mark, particularly the Gerasene demoniac, which has been where a lot of my stuff has been focused on. I'm really interested in that story. So, um, yeah, just sort of tracing that out and saying, you know, do we, and, and, that, and that's really kind of what ends up happening in Christian theology. The Old Testament is sort of reread in light of the character and the depiction of Satan in the New Testament. And that's sort of retrojected back into the Old Testament and is sort of used to flesh out the picture in, mm -hmm. um, that, that's used as a lens for interpreting the Satan in Job, but then also particularly Isaiah 14 with the uh, Hillel ben Shahar, the, the, uh, the power that's cast out of heaven is interpreted as a Satan passage, kind of a presaging what's going to, you know, say what Satan will be. It's sort of, you read, you read Isaiah 14 in light of revelation, basically. And the same thing happens with Ezekiel 28, I think, where you have the 28, 29, maybe where you have this very, uh, uh, kind of interesting depiction of <clears throat> probably a King and the glory of a King and stuff like that. And being kicked out of Eden and things like that for arrogance or whatever. And so those, so Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, I think it is, I end up sort of being read in light of the new Testament and other, other passages of the old Testament. So my question was, how do we, how do we get there? How do we go from old Testament to new Testament? And for a long time, I thought there were 400 years of silence between the old and the new. Uh, that's not the case. There's a lot of writings that are going on because people were writing and people were interested in a lot of things. So God, we don't have to read those though. So the religious life of Israel doesn't stop. Um, as you have probably been told several times. And yeah, so that's where a lot of the, there's a lot of Satan speculation. There's a lot of origins of evil stuff going on as uh, particularly in the second simple period. So um, what's the second temple period? So roughly, let's say roughly 200 BC to 200 CE. Okay. More or less. And there's just, there's a lot of questions about uh, what is Israel's place in the world. Israel has sort of been occupied by a lot of powers, but then you have the rise of the Hasmoneans and they throw off foreign powers for a while. And so, but then they're conquered by Rome again eventually. So it's, it's, it's really interesting, the literature that develops in this period as the, as the Jews are working out the question of what does it mean to be the elect people of God under foreign oppression for years and years and years and years, and then to have a glimpse of freedom and then have that taken away again. And yeah, so it's just really interesting. The literature is really fascinating. The problem of evil in this period is really sort of dwelt upon at length. The origins of evil are dwelt upon at length and it's really some good stuff. So this isn't, this is particularly striking because I think one of the things that we deal with in the church a lot specifically is this concept of the role Satan plays in the day-to-day -day life of most Christians, right? And uh, for better or worse, for correct or incorrect, right? Some of the things that we typically hear, and, and it's it's spoken of as it's as if it's just kind of understood to be the reality, right? So anytime something bad happens in our life, mm -hmm. uh, one of the first instances that we, I think either habitually or just kind of out of, you know, for what kind of training or Pavlovian training, whatever it might be, right? this idea of like associating any type of negativity that occurs in our daily life with this concept of Satan. So much so that, and, and this is why this is interesting, and I'm glad you're doing this because this is a lot of reading and studying that I have zero desire to do, but I do want to know the answers to. So the idea of Satan is almost presented as an omnipresent figure mm -hmm. in this idea of being able to, if you are where you are in the world and Chris and I are in the studio and something ha bad happens to both of us at the same time, we go, oh man, that was a spiritual attack or Satan was coming mm -hmm. after us there. So we've uh, almost described this omnipresence to Satan. So one of the things that we were hoping to have you kind of do or give us some clarity and direction on is this idea of uh, where do these ideas come from that where we've just kind of assumed this all present, maybe even fairly almost all powerful and kind of the way that we talk about the, the Satan character. Uh, where do we get some of our understandings from? Uh, what are some you know, misconceptions that we have currently in kind of Western evangelicalism of Satan and his role in the church and just kind of his role in, in daily life. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. So in terms of the, do you mean in terms of contemporary, like where do these ideas come from in a contemporary context or in terms of their biblical witness or something like that? Sure. 
because I can answer the latter better than I can answer the the. Uh, well, let's the start with ones. biblical witness and so, work our way forward. Yeah, so I think there's there's sometimes this question. Um, Christianity is often not called dualistic. It's often you know it's monotheism, but there's there's good reason to think that if it's that most forms of monotheism sort of struggle with the question of evil in the world. That, that's one of, that's one of the difficulties of of a religious system that says okay our god is all powerful all good all loving but then we have this presence of evil in the world and so that that remains one of the one of the most challenging theological questions for christians for muslims for jews i think and for other monotheistic groups that and then you, so you have to find some way to to account for that because then because the problem the problem of evil it's either impinging on god's sovereignty god's ability mm-hmm. to solve the problem or it's impinging on god's goodness um and and this and this is a very deep struggle it's a very it's a very sincere difficulty for a lot of people who are trying to hold fast to those ideas but at the same time you experience a lot of bad things in the present reality so there are a lot of ways to answer that you can be fatalistic about it um but because that's sort of that's sort of built into the belief system and it's built into the theology it's it, because it's just part of the human experience it tends to manifest itself in a kind of dualism. So it, so Christianity isn't properly dualistic, but it'll have um, some guys have referred to it, or some men and women have referred to it as sort of dualistic strains. So you, you, you can either you can have forms of Christianity that are sort of more explicitly dualistic that heighten the contest between you know good and evil within within the Christian system, and then others that sort of downplay it and make you know kind of go back to a more Old Testament model, a Hebrew Bible model, where God is the source of even Satan's activity and stuff like that. And that's a little bit more fatalistic. So I think what's happening, this is my own opinion, I think what you're seeing in the New Testament, in most of the documents in the New Testament, most of the books, is a form of basically Jewish apocalyptic thought that is struggling a lot with the problem of evil. And basically views evil as a very active power and and God may be containing it and God may be contesting it but evil is active powerful it seems to have its own kind of agency it's it doesn't seem to be directed i mean like satan in the gospels doesn't seem to be particularly directed by god like right, it, it, it's right. i mean there 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 is a sense in which his activity is curtailed or you have something like in john where it's all foreordained and stuff like that so so in the gospel of john it's it's and in, in that that element is sort of in all of the gospels but you don't have you don't have like you do in job where god and satan have an aside and they talk and god says test him so that you know you'll get these results or whatever that doesn't seem to be happening so in in the gospels you get kind of a curtailing maybe of satan's agency there's some predetermined stuff the son of man has to go and has to die and stuff like that but by and large evil seems to be a very real present force in the way that it's expressed in a lot of the new testament documents and for me i tend i tend to view that through a lens of a particular kind of Jewish apocalypticism. And there are people who would disagree with me on, on that. And the best way to read Jesus ministry, is he an apocalyptic prophet? Is he a cynic prophet? Thing, I mean, things like that. There are different ways to characterize and to understand what's going on there. But um, that that's sort of what I see going on. So, so what, so what that ends up happening is evil is a very real present force. And it's something that sort of is, as much as Jesus ministry is about dying for people. And so even in Mark, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a death for people for the forgiveness of sins and things like that. So it, it's a kind of sacrificial death. There, that, that language seems to be there in our, in our earliest witnesses about, as we think about the death, burial and resurrection. But at the same time in the gospels, you also have this entire, you know, you don't just have the, the death, burial and resurrection. You have this entire ministry and that ministry seems to be bound up in exorcistic mm-hmm. activities. So, fighting Satan and invariably, at least in the synoptic gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Satan is behind uh, not just demon demon possession, but is behind um, physical ailments, behind like, you know, binding people, making them cripples, all this kind of language. So the healings a lot of times in the gospels are also a kind of affront on the kingdom and power of Satan. So there, there's a lot of this, it, again, in, in all of the gospels really, but in my mind right now, I'm thinking of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's this language of sort of the kingdom of God is invading and is coming in to dominate and take away the power that's been given, however that's given. It's not entirely clear, but that Satan seems to have a kind of agency on the earth, that God reigns in heaven, God rule, and God ultimately has control over timing and when the world is going to be made right, but this present reality is sort of shot through with all kinds of evil and stuff like that, and the ministry of Christ is sent to... <laughs> lessen that and mm-hmm. to stop that essentially so 
So then, okay, so if that functions as our base, then what are potentially some kind of misunderstandings that we make in kind of our, our current day scenario about Satan, Satan's temptation? Um, do we give, in your estimation, kind of too much credit to Satan when bad things are happening in our life, perhaps? I think that it kind of depends on who you're asking, right? It, de it depends on kind of the confessional perspective. And it also depends on the kind of worldview that you're experiencing your Christianity in. So there, there are there are plenty of cultural contexts where evil spirits and possession and things like that, those are a part of daily life and experience. And that is also a part of a lot of American traditions as well. But there's, but I think for a lot of, for a lot of Americans, I think for a lot of American Christians, um, things like possession and stuff like that aren't the norm. And they're, they're not like, like I've never, like I've not encountered anybody who's demonically possessed and I've grown up in the church and stuff like that. And I, I know a lot of American evangelicals who've never sort of seen that kind of spiritual power or affliction or something like that. So in terms of whether that's like, like I don't, what's your question again? Sorry, I'm, I'm, the, I'm losing track here. No, that's fine. The idea of we have a propensity to say when something bad is going on in our life, right? When something is occurring that is negative or mm -hmm. not desirable for us in our personal scenarios, we have an, a tendency if we're in the church to kind of automatically attribute that to yeah. okay. the enemy. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I remember where I was going to go with this. So I think it's very easy to, to overstate that. It's very easy to say every calamity, every negative thing, every, every illness, every disease, all those kind of things that those are, those are the work of Satan and demons and stuff like that. And there's a way to make that case out of the new Testament, I think, but there's also a way to argue against that even from the new Testament. Cause there, there is a sense in which, you know, you have the language about the man who's, um, the man who I think he's lame in John and the disciples ask, you know, why did this happen to him? Is it because he sinned or his, his parents sinned? And there's no language there that Satan bound that person or caused that. And Jesus just said, neither. This is for the glory glorification of God. And so, I mean, that that's kind of an ambiguous text, but it, it's not, it's not clear that even in the new Testament writings that every single affliction is caused by Satan. So I, I, personally don't think that even the new testament witness is saying every every bad thing that happens that that satan basically has the same kind of power that god has in the present creation now granted there is a lot of power ascribed to satan in yeah the, so, so you would say he is no text. doubt like extremely powerful as presented kind of in yeah in the Gospels, but also even in kind of the letter the letters right of, of paul and peter the idea of the your devil being on the prowl like a roaring lion looking yeah. for someone to devour, right? Saint Peter, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and but but even in Paul, so there, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion in Pauline scholarship as to the full, like what extent does to what extent does Paul give power to Satan actually? And this this is actually not a very it's actually not a very straightforward question. So there are there are some mentions of Satan in Paul, and Satan has a kind of activity. But there, but there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot writing on how you understand his references to Satan. Paul doesn't necessarily go into a thing that says Satan has all this power over all these things. He sort of mentions mentions Satan kind of in passing in a number of different passages, and they're 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 kind of compressed, they're kind of cryptic, and there's a lot of debate as to how much to read into those references. Because w one of the interesting things that I, that I have found, at least it's interesting to me, there are forms of Jewish apocalyptic literature that don't that won't really refer to heavenly powers as being the cause of evil in the world that it's just sort of sin is the problem and there there's a there's a strong contingent of, of Pauline scholarship or, or people studying Paul who would say that Paul doesn't really like he thinks of Satan as maybe having power but for Paul there are bigger things at stake things mm -hmm. like sin and death that Paul has a kind of maybe a sort of even different understanding than the gospels are putting forth. And that, and that depends on, you know, how much th there's a presupposition there, whether there's a lot of diversity in new Testament thought or not, but let's grant for the moment that there is, if, if that's the case, then there, a lot of scholars have argued that Paul doesn't see Satan as having this end all be all power, but that thing that, that death is sort of a force that yeah, kind yeah. of has the it's power of Satan. Entity, Essentially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so all that to say, there's, it seems to be even variation in the New Testament as to sort of what is the full agency of Satan? How much power does he actually have? So there, there seems to be 
in the New Testament perspective, a mix of views that like Satan can have power, bad things can just happen to people, and then demons can afflict people too. So it, it's kind of a, a smorgasbord of unfortunate things that people can be afflicted by at any given time. So, cause people still go to doctors. I mean, there are physicians in the ancient mm -hmm, world mm -hmm. that don't do exorcism that just do try to treat physical things and stuff. So, um, you know, the understanding of evil isn't uniform necessarily in the Greco Roman context. So, so you're saying it, it may be hard for us to delineate. Uh, it's actually probably impossible to delineate how much particular power Satan or death or evil might have, but it's definitely a lot. It's pretty much across the board, depending on whatever author you read. Yeah, and I think just, so. There's, there's at least a lot. I think so. I think that the New, New Testament and even and even the Old Testament, but especially the New Testament, it's written by a group of people who are under Roman domination, who are who see themselves as being in continuance with the elect people of God who have been under foreign domination. And I, I think they look out into the world and they see a lot of death, a lot of disease, a lot of bad conditions you know, rampant slavery, all famine, all these kind of things. And they, they see a world that is not under the control of God fully. And so, and that, and that's why there's sort of that pointing to that end time hope mm -hmm. and stuff like that and the returning of the son of man. And so there, there's, there is a very, I think a very, very sober and a very realistic understanding that, that creation, even though it will be made anew, and even though there are good elements there, there's a lot that's not good. Okay. And, and Satan is a part of that framework and a part of that understanding. A, a big part, a very yeah. important piece. Yeah, very, a very key piece, but not omnipotent, I, yeah. would, I, I don't yeah. think. So then, okay, so then let's wrap this up with kind of some, uh, I think, pragmatic okay. application value for us. So what are, in your estimation, some things that we can do to pr maybe better understand, right, the difference that something that may constitute as spiritual warfare in our lives versus just kind of the happenings or mishappenings, rather, of life? Yeah. So I've been I've been thinking a lot about this question because one one of the interesting conclusions that a lot of different scholars of different confessions, different denominations, persuasions have come to is that Jesus probably was an exorcist and a good one, uh, an, an, an effective one. And that's partially what got him into trouble. And I've sat with that for a long time, because if that's if that's that's true then it, it, the question for me is what do i do with that what, what do i make make of that as a person who we need to start a snake handling ministry as, as bringing a, it back as a as a person who, who like that's just not a part of my of my framework and so it will be what does that mean for <laughs> it's our family okay it's the carbon snake handling business you and chris we're doing this of course yeah <laughs> you get the snakes <laughs> our next podcast will be our last podcast <laughs> Well, I've snake uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think one way to think about it, one way that I, I guess one way that I've been thinking about it, and I think it's, I think it's pra it's pragmatic for me and I, and I hope it is for other people, but the, the ministry, and I'm thinking mostly of the gospels, the, the ministry of, of Christ is, is all about the bringing in the kingdom of God over against like the kingdom of pain and evil and death. And so much, so much of what Jesus does, not only in, not, you know, not only does the death, burial and resurrection unite us to God in this kind of amazing mystical way and uh, open up this avenue of life for us in, in a sort of, in a way that's just phenomenal and super mysterious. And, and I'm still, I still don't know all the ramifications of that, but the, the ministry, the earthly ministry of, of Christ is filled with um, feeding people and delivering people from, you know, taking lame people and making them whole mm -hmm. or, you know, healing a demon possessed man. And so I, so personally, it, it seems to me that that is a model for how we think about ministry, how we think about church, how we think about theology, that it is about bringing life into the world. And, and it, and Christianity is, is all about life and it's, and it's all about stopping death. And there are many, and death manifests itself in all of these ways. It manifests itself in you know, when people get shut off from community, when people get shut out, when people get marginalized, when people get um, oppressed in all kinds of different ways. And so our our job in, in ministry, our job in life as Christians is to sort of seek out, seek out anyone who is suffering from like contemporary manifestations of death and to speak life and speak truth into that. And one of the ways I think about this is sort of like, like addiction or something like that, right? Like that's a, that's a really interesting um thing to think about at least for me because you or not just addiction but people who feel like um 
like they're like they have internal demons and stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost just coming back around to screw tape, right? I mean, this is part. This is partially I'm how reading that right This now, is partially actually. how Lewis like kind of handles the problem of evil and Satan. Like basically, like it's an internal voice that's coming from within you that sort of just dominates and, and sends you negative thoughts, sends you into these bad loops, sends you into destructive thoughts, all these kind of things. And um, addiction is interesting to me to hear people talk about it because it it's it sort of it feels like you know. It, 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 to me, it feels like what the Garrison demoniac is going through. He's this guy. He doesn't want to be doing what he's doing, but he has these forces, these internal forces that are driving him to destroy himself, to pick up these rocks and to cut himself with stone and to hurt his family, to hurt his friends and to all these kind of, and that sound, I mean that I'm not saying that like that story is about addiction, right, but, the, right, but there's right. a way to read that powerfully as It'll saying, preach. As, preach. well, as saying that we, that we are all, we all struggle with and grapple with these internal forces, these anxieties, these deficiencies, um, for whatever reason that lead us into places of death. And the gospel is all about undoing that. And it's all about, you know, not bringing just again, salvation in the afterlife, but like salvation starting now right, and right. starting with the undoing so of those kind of things. Would your estimation be then that anything that we do that seeks to really live out in the margins, kind of like what you're saying, seeking people out in the margins, spending time there, you know, on purpose, uh, anything that kind of gets in the way of, of that would be easy, you know, be able to be classified as kind of a spiritual warfare type thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think there, there are always, there are always forces at work to stop that kind of stuff. Right. I mean, there, and, and there, and we're talking about like, I mean, you can talk at a structural level. I mean, you know, I mean, this is, this is the, the history of humanity that like power gets aggregated in certain places. It gets holed up in certain places. Money gets holed up in certain places and it doesn't get out to other places. And so it, it, in, you end up marginalizing people all the time and stuff like that. Whether that's a demonic force mm-hmm. or not, I mean, that, that depends on how you want to interpret that. But the, but the, I would say that the act, the act of doing that kind of stuff, any, anything that is leading toward death, anything that is tending toward death is a kind of demonic thing. Right. And, and that, that's, that's, sort of the the best way it's one of the the most pragmatic ways that helps me think about it mm-hmm. now because it it's it for me that takes sort of the demonic from being an ethereal sort of disembodied abstraction yeah, and, yeah. and saying no this is happening on the ground all the time and 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 it's everything from systemic stuff but it you know it's not just marginalization of like large groups and stuff like that that's a huge part of it but it's also individuals wrestling with eating disorder, wrestling with, feel, you know, feelings of inferiority, all, all these kind of things. People who have demons who are walking around with these thoughts that just tend toward their own self-destruction and stuff like that. Suicidal thoughts. I mean, suicidal thoughts are literally the destruction of your body. I mean, that is, that is, I think, demonic. It is the destruction of creation. It is the destruction of the self. Um, you know, yeah. So I don't know if that so if you struggle with depression, that means you are demon possessed. No, the, no, 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 <laughs> just kidding. Not, no, but, but no, yeah, that's, that's, uh, maybe needs to be said more, more in a more nuanced way. No, it's, it, but we, but we, I think we, we often deal with every day, all of us, um, no matter what's going on, we, we all deal with forces inside of us that often push us in directions. They pressure us in sure. directions that we don't necessarily want want to do you know i mean people lash out at people that they and they they don't necessarily want to do it but they do it um they don't want to eat as much they don't want to take that substance but they still you know you still do it and you start and you hit a point where you start doing it to the detriment of yourself and people around you so i don't know that that's that's not like demon possession but that really is kind of like like again it's kind of just circling back to like that's how lewis sort of does this in screw tape letters it's that you know, there, there's these influences that kind of just move in through your psyche and kind of mm-hmm. just push you in these destructive ways. So. so then, all right, let's, well, what's our time, Chris? We'll wrap up here real quick. 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, last question. What is your, all the studying compounding, you know, into the brain as you're getting ready to, to write this huge dissertation? Uh, what is like one of the most, just one practical piece of takeaway that you can give for our mini listener? as a believer, something that they can kind of put into practice in terms of how to live. How can they sharpen their, their walk as it were? I would say seek out and actively practice things that bring joy and beauty and fulfillment, because those are some of the most effective ways of speaking light into darkness. All right. Succinct and one sentence. So there you have it. 
Uh, if you didn't ever read your Bible before, demons are a real thing. You heard it here first. Be sure to follow us on all forms of social media, facebook.com forward slash faith and whatever, and we are at youtube.com slash faith and whatever. We actually got our own YouTube link. They gave that to us. All right. Terrible. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Josh underscore Carmen. John doesn't have one. James is at James Y-U-I-L-E. Garrett is at T Student Life. Garrett just had a new baby. We love you. Chris is at Marion Ranch. Uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by, and we'll talk to you again real soon.